And then at the end of the meeting, remember to turn them back on. Uh, <laughs> just saying. Um, we'll need a roll call. And definitely. First, we have Chair O'Neill. Here. Vice Chair Smith Carvello. Present. Commissioner Collum. Here. Commissioner Dawson. Here. Commissioner Hambaro. Here. Commissioner Rath. Here. And Commissioner Rodriguez. Here. Thank you all for confirming. We do have a full house today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, on the consent agenda, we have approval of the minutes uh, from our last uh, meeting and um, July 29th. Are there any additions or corrections? Uh, can we have a motion to accept? I'll move to accept the minutes as written. I'll second. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Everyone. Um, Commissioner Collum, did you second? I second. She did, yeah. Hard to see with the mask blocking your face. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd be used to this by now. Um, <laughs> We need to have take a vote on that. Yeah, we can um, go ahead with the motion and vote. But first, I do want to announce how, how viewers can attend through Zoom to provide public comment in case there are any comments on the minute. Members of the public are encouraged to join our meetings via Zoom Gov, a secure service that connects you live with no lag time. This meeting is also hybrid in person at the council chambers at Monterey City Hall. It is streamed live on youtube.com slash channel at City of Monterey with a 10 second delay and Comcast channel 25 with up to a 90 second delay. If you would like to provide public comment, please join the meeting using Zoom or by telephone, making sure to join in time to accommodate delays. To join the Zoom meeting from a computer or phone, use the link or phone numbers listed on the agenda posted at isearchmonterey.org. Since the meeting has started, you'll find the agenda under the recent chat. To join by telephone, dial 833-568-8864. This number is toll free. Once again, that is 833-568-8864. Then enter the webinar ID. If the first number does not work, please try another. There are more posted on the meeting agenda at isearchmonterey.org. This meeting's webinar ID, is 161-739-7120. Once again, 161-739-7120. If prompted for a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions for using Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meeting. To provide public comment, use the raise your hand function in Zoom at the bottom of the screen. If you are providing public comment by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, then star six to unmute when called upon. Public commenters calling in by phone will be announced using the last three, number, three phone number digits or the name typed into Zoom. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. Please turn off TV or computer speakers or go to another room while connected by phone as background noise interferes with the broadcast. Public speakers will be called upon in order of hands raised. The chair has designated a three minute time limit for today's meeting. Please stay within your time limit. Right now, I do see we have a few attendees um, in the Zoom and none of them are raising their hand. Does anyone here in person have any comments regarding the July 29th minute? No? Oh, there is a hand raised. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it just, went down. I do recommend, I noticed that name from a public comment earlier on a different item. So I believe that was a mistake. If I'm wrong, please raise your hand. So otherwise we'll go for the vote to approve the July 29th minutes. First, we have Chair O'Neill. Yes. Vice Chair Smith Carvello. Yes. Commissioner Collum. Yes. Commissioner Dawson. Yes. Commissioner Hambaro? Yes. Commissioner Rath? Aye. And Commissioner Rodriguez? Thank you. Thank you. Those motions.
carry that motion carries and the minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of the consent agenda and we're moving on to public comments and this is the time when the public can comment on anything that is not on our agenda this evening that pertains to historic preservation, of course. Anyone? All right, I'm closing the public comments uh, and beginning the public hearings. Uh, I just, I'm hoping all the commissioners got the um, email from Kim Cole reminding us of the pictures we get, um, staff presentation, a presentation from the applicant, and we don't discuss until we bring it back to the commission. All right. Um, so the first item on our agenda is number three, continued from the uh, July 29th meeting, uh, 999 Belden Street, uh, application to remove the property from the new Monterey historic context statement. Hi, my name is Christy Sabdo, associate planner with the city of Monterey. Um, I did want to ask the commission. Um, so staff forwarded the the video from the last meeting from the 729 Historic Preservation Commission meeting to Commissioner Rodriguez. And I wanted to ask if he watched that video with the presentation. Um, and if so, um, ask if you want me to present the PowerPoint again. Uh, no, thank you. I actually did. Uh, I did get that. Uh, email with the meeting from the 29th. I also reviewed the agenda packet uh, for that day and, and listened to the, your presentation. So it's not necessary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christy. Do any of the other commissioners need um, this presented again? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, should I ask the applicant to, um, to present? Mm -hmm. My name is Bob Winkleblack. My wife and I, Tracy, uh, own the property at 999 Belden. Um, <laughs> it dawned on me today that uh, I've been here and doing the same thing building as a building contractor. I think I'm historic. <laughs> um, the house in question there at 999 Belden, um, I have to admit, Connie, you you caught me very unawares last last meeting. Um, the way a builder at least looks at that is um, we've got a low pitched roof, tar and gravel covering. We've got single pane windows, aluminum windows with a casement crank out. Uh, there's not a stitch of insulation in the house. Uh, it's got a automatic sectional garage door that goes up and down and uh, very plain horizontal siding and no gingerbread as far as the fascias or double fascias or um, I, I was very unaware that that one this one could even possibly be of significance for you folks. Um, I did reach out to the original Dr. Kirk who did the uh, historic um, evaluation. And I believe he's on Zoom today mm -hmm. and he could answer probably some questions that got a little more particular than I could. So I would be happy to turn it over to Dr. Kirk. Any okay, questions, um, I'll be right here. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Kirk. Hello. Um, I would like to say a couple of things. One is with regard to the last meeting, I looked at the tape and at some point, Carol O'Neill said that the DPR had written, had um, stated that the property had been uh, 
evaluated for the period 1920, 1923. And I never said anything like that at all. I didn't give any particular time period for evaluating it. We both know that it was uh, created and built after the Second World War. She also said that the, um, as I recall, that there are no defining features to the building and that's untrue. There are defining features. And I make mention of them in my DPR report. Um, she also states that the house was not designed in the contemporary style, but in a vernacular style and that's not true. When you look at the information sheet that Paige and Turnbull, who did a windshield survey of the city of Monterey wrote, it says in her description, rectangular lot, west corner of Belden Street and Reservoir Line Street, one story, wood frame construction, rectangular plan, and then contemporary style. That's where the contemporary style came from. So in evaluating the building, I looked at a standard work that I use whenever I'm evaluating something, which is written by Virginia Savage and McAllister. It's a big book, it's a heavy book. It has over 800 pages in it. And in looking through the contemporary style discussion, there are eight identifying features that she makes mention of. And they are a low pitched gable roof, of widely overhanging eaves. Commonly it has exposed roof beams. Windows are generally present in the gable ends. It's built with natural materials such as wood, stone, brick, and occasionally concrete blocks. There's a broad expanse of uninterrupted wall surface, typically on the front facade. The entrance may be recessed or obscured, and it has an asymmetrical plan. And looking at the 9989 Belden, I only could see three of those identifying features. It clearly has a low pitched gable roof, but doesn't have widely overhanging eaves. I would call the eaves on the narrow side. It doesn't have, it does have exposed reef roof beams. There's three of them that can be seen at the front. There are no windows in the gable ends. It's obviously built with natural materials. It was built with wood. It has V-Rod siding. It doesn't have a broad expanse of uninterrupted wall surface, typically on the front facade. Uh, there's a big window on the right-hand side and a much smaller window on the left-hand side. I would not say that the entry door was recessed or obscured. It can be easily seen on the front porch. And uh, it doesn't have an asymmetrical plan. So of the eight features that identify the contemporary style, I only saw three, the low pitched cable roof, the exposed roof beams, and the fact that it was built with natural materials. And based on that, I came to the conclusion that it was not a good example. In fact, it was a very poor example, even on the provincial level of that style of architecture. And so that's what I wrote in my DPR. And I would be happy to answer any questions or at least attempt to any question, answer any questions that you might have for me. Um, I, I have a question. Um, by the way, the 1920, 1923 um, it, reference was in the eligibility paragraph on, um, well, it's in today's packet, page 14. Um, the contemporary style is what you were basing the um, its non-eligibility on, um, yet it was never addressed for any other style. And if you look at the vernacular cottage style, um, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, it seems that there are way more defining features in the cottage style, which seems to be no style. Um, and they're really very, I'm sorry, vernacular cottage, yes. Um, and they seem to be very modest and not craftsman 
kinds of um, a craftsmen in the sense of people who build things well, not the craftsman style. Um, they're just houses and very modest. And would could you tell me how this would not be in the um, vernacular cottage style? I would ha be happy to address that question. As I say, I looked at the uh, windshield survey or the uh, reconnaissance survey that Page and Turnbull did. And as I noted earlier, it states it was built in the contemporary style. And so that's what I had to evaluate it under. It doesn't say vernacular, it doesn't say crap, it doesn't say that it's a modern building. It just says that it was built in a contemporary style. I can't introduce a style on my own accord because I didn't do the windshield survey. They did the windshield survey. It seemed to me that there were, was good reason to call it the contemporary style. And so I didn't argue with that. And that's what I used when I evaluated the property. I mean, I'm sure you realize that each building in the windshield survey or in the reconnaissance survey is given a style unless it's in the vernacular style, which essentially is no style. But this one had a specific style. And so that's what I had to address when I was evaluating the building. All right. Um, one other question um, is about the period, um, the post-war period. It seems that this would fit in with um, being associated with, and I'm reading from the um, Page and Turnbull um, evaluations, uh, associated with New Monterey's unprecedented growth during the period. A property um, may be significant for its association with the expanded military presence, et cetera, et cetera. So this was built in 1956 um, to no particular style. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and how would that not fit into the trends and patterns of New Monterey? Well, I um, have the uh, New Monterey Historic Center context statement uh, in front of me here. And um, on page 76 lists, so there's a summary of, uh, oh, there, okay, there it is. Um, there's a summary of significant themes. And the significant themes are fishing and canning industries. Uh, and then they went into decline in the second half of the uh, 1900s. And there is military and tourist related employment. Uh, and which took the place of the canneries and uh, it was a retirement destination. Uh, and then there was unprecedented growth. And I did not see any theme that was mentioned that this house would fit into. It wasn't associated with the fishing and canning industry. It wasn't a military or tourist related house. And um, it wasn't associated with an artist or any particular artist. It wasn't uh, owned by retirement, a person in retirement. And so I did not see any theme that it could be attached to. And that's why I state in the um, significance section, which is B10 on the second page, that um, it is not associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of the United States, California, or Monterey history. Uh, you don't consider this um, the post-war years and a period of unprecedented growth? I do. Um, it, you know, it, it, it seems to me what you're trying to say is that you think any house that was built after 1945 is significant because it was built after 1945. You would have a, an enormous number of buildings on your historic 
structure inventory if you were to take that position. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, um, there are a few, uh, however, that have not been altered. Um, well, well, that's not the, the, uh, the point of discussion. The point of discussion, number one, is when you are evaluating a building, you establish whether or not it is a good example or reasonably good example of a particular style of architecture. Once you have done that, then you evaluate it for integrity. I didn't evaluate it for integrity because to my knowledge, it was not associated with any particular theme that I could identify. It was not associated with a particular individual who was important in the history of Monterey. The only reason it was potentially significant was because of its architectural style which as uh, Paige and Turnbull says, is the contemporary style. And, and in this book that I held up earlier, when you look under contemporary style, there are, um, five subtypes. There is the, front gable roof subtype, the side gable roof subtype, the gable roof variations, the flat roof, and the butterfly and slant roofs. This was obviously a front gable roof. And as I say in my evaluation, it was not a good example. And that's why I stated that it was not, it should be removed from the uh, inventory of the historic properties. Okay, does anyone have other, I, I will say that you did uh, say that it, it retained uh, physical integrity. Uh, that was- it, it, that, that's, that's usually called integrity or historic integrity. Yes, that's, that's what you called it. There's, there's seven aspects to that. And, it, and in my opinion, it does retain its integrity. Thank you. Does anyone have questions of Dr. Kirk from the commission? No. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Would anyone well, else? Yes. Sorry. Um, so I'll turn my camera real sorry, quick, I but I'm having. I I just uh, I just raised. I couldn't find the button. Sorry about that. But I'm gonna turn off my camera because I'm having internet problems. So just just <laughs> to let you know that okay. I'm that I'm here. Uh, Dr. Kirk, I, I do have a question. You, you do mention that it's not like a. Um, uh, a perfect example of the style, but considering the area, um, and I know it well, uh, when my dogs were younger, I used to walk uh, down that alleyway and I would see that house uh, often. And to me, and admittedly, I'm not a architectural expert, but it seemed unique. So it might not be a prime example, like something that we would um, showcase, but considering the area, and other places, it does appear to me to be somewhat unique that it's worth preserving because nobody's building those types of houses the way they look. Uh, could that be an argument to, to keep it on the list? That's an argument, but I wouldn't say it was a very good argument. Um, the contemporary style is popular roughly from 1946 until 1990, which is of course why they're not building houses in that style any longer. Uh, in looking at the eight identifying features mentioned in uh, McAllister's book, I found three, the low pitched roof, the exposed roof beams, and the fact that it was built with natural materials. I don't think the third one is pretty important, but that is one of the identifying features. So eight potential identifying features that a contemporary house might have. This one only had three. And I would say even on a, on a local level, whereas when you evaluate a house or any building, it might be significant on a national level, a state level, or a local level. And I looked at this only on the local level for the city of Monterey. And in my opinion, it was not a good example of the contemporary style. And that is why I said it should be removed from the Historic Preservation Commission's list of historic buildings. Thank you. Any other questions 
from the commissioners? I have one. Uh, yes, Jerome. I'm, I'm interested in the exposed roof beam. And just as an um, informational thing, is that that little white board that's jutting out at the top pitch of the roof? Yep, because that's one of the roof beams. There's one uh, on the left where the porch is, and then there's one on the right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and typically, when you look at uh, the contemporary style of architecture, the uh, not only would the building have roof beams, but would have widely overhanging eaves. As I point out, this does not have widely overhanging eaves. I would call them minimally overhanging. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the commissioners to the... Uh, consultant. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on this particular agenda item? Okay, I'm closing the public comment on this and bringing it back to the commission for. Can I ask, do we have any callers from? Oh, I'm sorry, I forget. No, that's fine. <laughs> I'm glad you both on these hybrid meetings. Um, once again, to join the Zoom meeting from a computer or phone. Use the link or phone numbers listed on the agenda posted at iSearchMonterey.org. To join by telephone, dial 833-568-8864, toll free. Once again, 833-568-8864, then enter the webinar ID. If this number does not work for you, please try another listed on the meeting agenda. This webinar ID is 161-739. 7120. Once again, 161 739 7120. To provide public comment, use the raise your hand button in Zoom at the bottom of the screen. If you are providing public comment by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, then star six to unmute when called upon. Public commenters calling in by phone will be announced using the last three phone number digits or the name typed into Zoom. And I still see no hands raised. So I think it's safe we can move on. All right, um, bringing it back to the commission for um, discussion. And I, for those of you on, on Zoom commissioners, I'm gonna try and focus on the screen so I see your little waved hands, but if I miss you, wave, wave harder. <laughs> uh, uh, Geraldine. Well, I, I spoke uh, last time uh, to um, removing it um, because, I mean, removing it from historical reconnaissance survey um, because um, I'm seeing the product and I know that each house is an individual um, concern. You know, we don't just um, ignore that. But part of my, I've driven around the block maybe four or five times. I'm seeing this as kind of a whole, this area. Um, we met in June and we, um, I have the minutes of that meeting and we took two other residences that are in that same um, block off the reconnaissance survey, 616 David and 660 David. And I, I kind of see this as a, as a, a project evolving. When I drove around it this time, you know, a year later, it everything still looks so dilapidated. The upkeep is, and I know those aren't considerations, but um, I don't feel there are enough um, specific indicators to consider this a model of a period. I don't think we have. Um, and I know, you know, sometimes more humble houses are significant in themselves. We don't have to have an important person in every house. Um, or I could say people in humble houses are sometimes very important in their own right. But um, I don't see um, enough reasons to keep this house. I think even though visually there's some characteristics that, that um, are distinct. There's still kind of a general deterioration. I don't think that it's in 
uh, great condition. And I will again uh, support removing it from the reconnaissance survey. Anyone want to address that or say anything? Um, oh, okay. Go. Um, Linda. I appreciate what you just said. and um, But I, I think also that the uniqueness of Monterey is the, the wide variety of houses um, that are represented there. And um, I think it's important to, to protect the individual houses. Um, this one, it, the more I look at it, the more unique I believe it is. And it is representative of that time period. Um, and if we continue to remove these from um, the list, then we're not gonna have any representation of that time period. So I would um, humbly disagree and I would like to keep it on the, on the list. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'm going to add to what um, Linda said. I, I think when we get into whether it's a contemporary or a, a vernacular cottage, we're really talking about semantics. Um, so it will be to the architect who builds something totally new because it doesn't fit into a um, into some sort of uh, slot, apparently. I, I hope everyone understands that because you're listed as historic, it doesn't mean that you can't do anything to your building, um, that you can add on in an approved way uh, using the National uh, Register standards. Um, there are lots of things you can do. You can certainly add insulation. You can take out the um, aluminum window and put in uh, a wood window. Um, paint is something uh, certainly uh, usable. In my mind, you could probably add a second story on the back. I, that's not something um, I can write in stone, but I think that's been allowed on many historic one-story buildings. Um, paint is certainly something, if this had a great paint job and uh, cute shrubbery and whatnot, I think we'd be looking at it. To say that we need to take something off the list because it's dilapidated is, um, uh, I think, short, short sighted. Monterey was a uh, town of working class people with modest little houses. And um, we have fussed at some of these modest little houses that have had additions. Um, have the additions been too close to the original cute little cottage? House. So um, I, I think that uh, keeping Monterey, Monterey is keeping um, these small houses and, and letting the historic preservation, um, how we, we adapt these to modern life, let that process um, play out and not just tear things down and build new. Um, any Questions, comments? Anybody, any of my commissioners at home? Uh, Juan, your hand is up. Yes, thank you. I, I, I'm glad you brought that point up because I, that's something that also concerned me. The fact that it's dilapidated shouldn't factor into it. And you're absolutely right. I think if we had some nice, um, I don't know, lavender outside and the fence was a little bit better and the maybe the the satellite dish wasn't so visible we would have be having a completely different conversation uh plus not everybody um that lives in a historic house can afford at this time or at any moment to completely revamp it so whether it's a tad unkempt shouldn't factor into the this commission's decision in in my opinion thank you uh, anyone else wish to speak? Uh, Lori. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the environment around it as to whether or not if, if it is kept on the historic list, will it enhance 
the general outlook of that little area because it seems to me that a lot of things that were of that period or slightly before have been removed from the historic list and are probably slated for destruction, building larger houses. So in that context, I, I just, I really don't think it's worth keeping because it really doesn't have any historic value aside from the fact that it's a small cottage, well, a small contemporary house. And uh, as far as the aluminum windows that it has, if they're casement windows, those would have been from the period. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's insignificant to me that there are aluminum w windows there since those might be historical, but that doesn't give me a reason to keep the house on the historic list. Okay, uh, I think we lost, your, your lips are moving, but we're not hearing anything. And lips. Oh, really? Yeah. She finished. My lips are moving. Oh, there you go. I finished. Okay. I finished. <laughs> okay. I think there's I just a kind of stop with the video with uh, compared to yeah. the audio. Well, now we know how kids that have to go to hybrid learning still. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, any more discussion? Do we have a motion from anyone? I'll make a motion. Okay. I would like to move that we remove 999 Belden from the new Monterey Historic Context Statement and Reconnaissance Survey List. I second the motion. Geraldine seconded. Um, and do we, we take a vote with, on? I can take a roll call okay. vote, yes. You can also ask for any more commissioner comments. Okay, yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, any more discussion on this? Okay. Uh, I'll oh, one more thing. Yeah. I, I actually thought it was helpful to hear Dr. Kirk explain the criteria and what he um, uses as reference books. And um, on page 16 of our packet, it also seems to address the things that he talked about. Location was one of them. And I'm thinking, um, you know, we don't know, um, we, we can't always predict what, what is gonna happen, but we can imagine if we were to save this one little um, house, and the others have all been taken off the survey, you know, would, would the same project fit into the block that possibly the owner has an idea for? Mm -hmm. Or would they leave the little house and try to build around it? You know, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how this would move forward or would they appeal it? and then take it on to the next uh, commission. And so I'm looking at location, I'm looking at the setting, the, the physical environment and so forth. You know, we can all read them. And I'm just not- um, those, know, those I believe are, um, and I may be on the wrong page here, um, it, the integrity. The yes. Yeah, the so it, it, it's, it, it, shows integrity because it is in the same location. It has not been moved. Um, and again, in my mind, what makes Monterey Monterey is it's not a development where all the houses look the same. Um, it is uh, one kind of house here, another kind of house there, a big Queen Anne somewhere else. You know, um, it's, it's one of the most interesting cities to walk around because every house seems to be a little bit different. So um, is there more more discussion before we take the vote? We have a motion and a second to take it off the reconnaissance survey. Okay. Um, Jennifer, I think we can 
Thank we'll you for your patience the... while I finish up tidy, uh, okay. typing. <laughs> Carry on. I do have the first as Commissioner Collum and the second as Vice Chair Smith Corello. Yes. And for the vote, we have Commissioner O'Neill. Oh, sorry, Chair O'Neill. Uh, nay. That's no. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Smith Corello. I said, can I vote too? Yeah. No. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Just for no. the record. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Collum. I mean, I'm, yes. I'm saying yes. I support the motion. I'm you support sorry. removal from the list. Yes, I, I, I seconded it. I'm okay. Sorry. Just to be clear, the motion is to approve the application and remove the property from the list. Mm -hmm. um, and we left off on Commissioner Dawson. No. No, you have to go to me first. Oh, sorry, okay. Commissioner Collum. Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Hambaro. Yes. Commissioner Rath? No. And Commissioner Rodriguez? No. Did Dawson? Mm -hmm. What about? I didn't hear Commissioner Carol. Dawson. No, I didn't hear Carol. Commissioner Dawson, Dawson voted no. Oh, yeah. So, so far, I do have only three votes to approve and remove the list. And I do have four votes against it, against approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, this is appealable to the city council within 10 Planning days. Commission. Planning commission. Planning commission within 10 days. Okay. Um, do I have to do another motion then? I don't do know. not approve it. Mm -mm. No. No. That was yeah. that was what we did when we had a tie. Okay. It was a. a okay. Previously, yeah. the vote failed to pass because it was a tie. It was three to three with one commissioner absent. This vote, this motion to approve the application did not pass. The, so the property stays on the list. Okay. All right. Um, moving on. I've got so many papers here. Uh, to the next agenda item, which I believe is 100, uh, Baranda Lane. And um, staff has uh, told me that they would like to table that to a future meeting, but if there are uh, people from the public here who would like to address it, we can listen now. Do, do we need to take a vote to table it to a yes. future? Sure, we do need to take a, bo a oh. vote, and I see Commissioner Wait, oh, Dawson. I'm sorry, Carol Dawson is jumping out of her chair. Yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Um, I have to recuse on this item because I ne live near the Baranda Adobe. Okay. So I'm going to, I am going to turn off my um, audio and my video. So okay. I, I also, I want to go back and I was just thinking about this and Kim, uh, she chimed in and, and you, there, there does need to be a, a, a an, another motion for that previous item. So the, the, the motion to take it off failed. Okay, um, so we need to have a motion to deny the application. To deny the application. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, Carol, are you still there? Oh dear. Oh dear. Uh oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm here. I just had my um, just had my video and my audio off. <laughs> Let's not make this. All right, um, uh, Linda. I can make this. Okay. Um, I move to deny the application to remove. 999 Belden Street from the new Monterey Historic Context Statement and Reconnaissance Survey list. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, any more discussion on this? Uh, seeing none, um, Jennifer, could you call That's the roll, please? Definitely. Chair O'Neill? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Smith Cravello? No. Commissioner Collum? No. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Commissioner Hambaro? No. Commissioner Rath? Yes. And Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Thank you. This second motion has passed. The property or the application is denied and the property will stay on the historic context statement and reconnaissance survey list. Thank you. Okay, now let's move on to 100 Veranda Lane. Um, 
and it has been uh, asked that we table it. Do we need a motion to do yes, that? Yes, and to table it to a date uncertain so staff okay. has the opportunity to respond to all the comments received. Okay, and uh, I know, I think there are some people here who want to address this. Should we take their public comment now or ask them to come back at a further That's up date? to the commission. I'm happy to hear. Okay, how, how many people are here to? Okay. Yeah, let's listen. Okay, so. I'll, I'll add, we can't deny them to provide public comment, but no, you could I would, recommend yeah. they save them for another meeting, yeah. just in I'm, case they can't attend a next, the next meeting. Yeah, you know. I was going to say, if you're here and you would like to right. make your comments, that's more than fine. Will be able to speak at the next meeting? Yes. 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 Okay, well, we so, okay, um, so if anyone would like to speak on that, come up and uh, if you would give your name for the- Thank uh, you, secretary. and while we shuffle around for the in-person comments, I will just add for the viewers on, on Zoom, the method of, join of joining to provide public comment via Zoom. And that would be um, to join the the, Zoom meeting from a computer or phone using the link or phone numbers provided on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. To join by telephone, dial 833-568-8864, toll free. There are more phone numbers on the meeting agenda at isearchmonterey.org if that first one does not work. You will need to enter a webinar ID for this meeting. It is 161-739-7120. Once again, 161-739-7120. Once you're in the, the Zoom meeting, please raise your hand with the button in Zoom at the bottom of the screen. Or if you are providing public comment by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, then star six to unmute when called upon. Public commenters calling in by phone will be announced using the last three phone number digits on screen or the name typed into Zoom. And just a reminder, we will have a three minute timer which Christy and I will both start on three, one, two, three. Okay. Commissioners, I'm Blake Matheson. I am the applicant, and it was a pleasure meeting you all on the field trip a couple of days ago. I know this motion is being tabled and that's fine, but I wanted to take the opportunity to comment just because I know the cars and Marianne are here um, who had some concerns about the project. And there's also lots of interested members of the public listening. I wanted to just frame the context about what we're really trying to accomplish here. Um, my parents and then I have fallen in love and stayed in love with Veranda since we bought it about 12 years ago. When you get to the property and um, you realize it's the oldest residence in Monterey on four secluded acres, I know you guys being historians appreciate this. Um, our goal really is to try and find a way to forge a public-private partnership where public access is granted that never has, and then there's some kind of private event activity that can offset the cost of the property. What we've put forward is my best stab at what seems like a reasonable solution, but obviously as we go back and forth with staff and concerned members of the public, um, something else may emerge and it may take many more years. Um, you know, my family's been here for five generations and maybe it'll take another generation to get this project done, but whatever it takes, we're committed to that vision and trying to find um, a way to make this work that the most number of people uh, can live with. So thank you and we'll see you in a month or two, I guess. Thank you. Is it is it appropriate to ask why it's being tabled? Uh, it's being... Sure. Uh, we received a number of comments, um, both in support of and in opposition of the project, or just concerns. And so staff would like adequate time to respond to all of those comments. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, the next um, comment, please. Good afternoon, commissioners, uh, city staff, and the public. My name is Barbara Schilling, and uh, me and my husband, we have submitted a letter of concern to the city, which should be in front of you. 
um, concerning um, traffic um, that would be um, increased um, to large public events at the proposed uh, site, Casa Boranda. Um, I live across the street from Casa Boranda in Casa Buena, which is also a historic building that was built at around the same time, 1820. And um, uh, that's where I reside. Um, the traffic. Uh, for sorry, large I'm events, sorry. Could you yeah, speak up mic. just a little bit? You're a little muffled, and the there is a mic. mic. Yeah, the <laughs> mask doesn't help. I understand that. <laughs> I, we understand. Um, I live in Casa Buena, which is just across the street on Mesa Road from Casa Boranda. And Casa Buena, as well as Casa Boranda, they were built at the same time around 1820, and so we live in a historic building as well, and it's our private residence. Um, we um, have concerns about traffic increase that would be detrimental to the neighborhood and to the residents living in the area uh, coming from public events uh, through traffic and traffic noise. Um, the proposed entrance and exit rounds are all um, guided on narrow streets. That's what the neighborhood is. It's uh, winding narrow streets. There are no sidewalks. Um, the entrance route proposed is Mesa Road. It's narrow and windy. Um, it's used by local residents not only to drive. There are a lot of residents that use it to walk or bike into town and from town. Um, so it's more than a, a road to get somewhere. Um, the proposed exit um, route, uh, Boronda Lane, Perry Lane, Major Sherman Lane, Again, a very narrow streets. I'm not sure that you take that shortcut too to go um, places, but it's, it's a hazardous environment for people walking, definitely for people driving as well. Um, uh, Major Sherman Lane even has a section um, that is a one lane only and oncoming traffic has to wait and respect that. And I haven't personally seen an accident, but it is really hazardous. And it's not even um, uh, really a, a good road to, to, uh, for the current use um, of, of the amount of traffic that comes by cutting through the neighborhood, by um, businesses there. So already we have a problem on these streets as well. Um, this is really unsafe for the cars and for, for pedestrians and, and, and residents of the neighborhood. Um, when you do a, a Google Maps route, which is what everybody young enough use, uses today, um, you find uh, there, are, there are a couple of ways that people get to... Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Uh, how much more do you have? Not much one or two sentences we had to get her to unmuffle there for or did you reset i did not reset when okay. that happened let's give you a couple more sentences thank you our major concerns are increase in traffic and uh, 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 road noise um, there are granted 24 events that are large events up to um, 250 people and then there is also a proposal for three uh, public events that draw hundreds of people um, so maybe the number doesn't sound so bad, 27 uh, events, large events in our neighborhood. But when you consider that there is uh, days before and after the event where there is traffic and noise and, and uh, increased uh, by, by the event for event set up and take down, um, it really creates at least 72 days where we have to deal with that. Um, in addition, it's probably to be expected on weekends. So we might have all of summer, every weekend, um, uh, large events or even more. So anyway, we op oppose this um, proposal, um, a commercial use um, for large events, and it has no gains for the residents. And we, all the residents agree on that. It's just a negative impact. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. So, I'm Richard Carr, owner at, with my wife of the 200 year old Casa Buelna. We are only three years younger than the Casa Buelna, so we are, have a very similar situation to them. Um, 
that's Pastor Barana, sorry. I hope you've had a chance to read our comments. They are long and they are very detailed. And three minutes doesn't allow us to even get halfway into any of those. So um, that those comments have support by uh, 12 other households as well. Those are the only ones I actually contacted. Those are the ones on Mesa Road and in on uh, Baranda Lane and on, Ma on uh, Major Sherman Drive. And there are no known local supporters of this resolution other than Mr. Blake here. <laughs> um, there's another uh, letter in your packet from Craig Spencer, who is a planning manager for the county and a secretary for the historic resources review board of the county. He finds extreme um, flaws in the, in the basic proposal and the basic resolution. Okay, so our major argument is about amplified sound. There's a section 22-17, which was never mentioned in the resolution or in the staff report. It forbids amplified sound for commercial purposes and also in any residential district. So the Casa Baranda proposal fails both tests. Uh, the Casa Baranda is owned by a for-profit Corporation, Raven's Path LLC, specializing in private investments with shareholders that are expecting it to be a profitable business. The claim is that the cost of Miranda is not making enough revenue to be profitable. This is a simple business case, not a cultural benefit issue. Um, with the Mills Act, the owners of the cost of Miranda are only paying $4,000 a year in property taxes. This is normal taxes would be $22,000. Um, so they're saving $18,000 a year. Um, they have already signed a contract that requires them to preserve and maintain the historic adobe, and they're getting this tax rebate for that purpose. There's no great expense to maintaining Casa Baranda. We have a very similar structure. Uh, we paint it every 10 years, it costs $16,000. Um, so they need to provide more evidence that the Casa Baranda is somehow very expensive to maintain. Um, Marty Manson would have spoken today about the very great difficulty of putting on large um, free events for the public. It's a very expensive process. The, um, the applicant has not said he's going to put up any money into this, into, into making that happen. He is, I, Thank you. I have 15 more seconds. Uh, actually, your wife took a uh, way longer than a couple of. You know, this process so. is really poor because there's no way for us to actually state what the problems are. Three minutes is nothing. So I'd like to make that point. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this? Good afternoon. My name is Marianne McCormick, and I'm at 935 Mesa Road, which is diagonal to Casa Baranda. And I uh, submitted a letter uh, a couple of days ago, which outlined the majority of my points, many of which are the same as the Schilling Park contention has made, and as well as what many of the other neighbors have made. So I won't go further into that, but I think my big concern is a precedent that might be set to have a business moving into the neighborhood what that might mean for the traffic in our area, what might that might mean to the city's um, feel need to expand the road or somehow change the nature of our small community with its sweet winding roads. So um, in general, I just like to add that to my previous comments. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the Baranda Road? agenda item. All right, I'm closing public comments. And um, do I ask again, do we need to vote to table this or? Yes, can we, is there, are there any public comments? There are public oh, comments in the Zoom meeting that we will need to address before we can move on. Um, and the first I see is, and I do apologize, I don't know what, in what order these hands were raised, but I will do the best I can and get to you all. So first we have Craig Spencer. I will give you permission to speak and you should be able to provide your public comment now. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, and I'm not sure if I have ability to use my my camera or not. Um, but uh, I understand this matter is being tabled. And uh, my name is Craig Spencer, by the way. Um, I live at 60 Baranda Lane in the apartments, right adjacent to Costa Baranda. And I've been here for more than 10 years with my two kids who are now in Monterey High School. Um, I won't go into too much of the traffic and noise issues that have already been discussed today. Um, I do believe that this commission ha is tasked with a recommendation to the planning commission. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by city staff's um, uh, uh, direction to take those uh, comments, which I have submitted under, under advisement and respond to them. I'm also encouraged by the applicant's uh, statements about making this property available to the public for uh, for use and for inspection and uh, for in public enjoyment. Uh, I'm here to tell you that 250 people at that site is too many people. Um, I'm only 100 yards away from where this would occur. I have single pane windows in my house. Um, I. I uh, before I end this meeting, I'll just uh, use a couple of my seconds so that you can hear. I have both my windows and doors open. Sorry. And and there is no sound. Um, there's no sound right now. And I, I uh, you know, the applicant went and did some uh, landscaping the other day, I'm assuming, for the site visit that the Historic Preservation Committee did. Um, with the doors and windows closed inside my house, inside my living room where I work um, every other week, um, you could hear very clearly all of that noise. Plus you can hear people talking on that site. Um, 250 people at 24 events um, is, is a significant change in use. Um, there's not enough parking on that site. And so um, I'm hoping that when this item comes back to the commission, there's some information about what's required in the Mills Act contract, um, what the historic preservation aspects of this project will be. Um, are people, um, uh, is this going to be meeting the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation? Yes, there are some allowances for adaptive reuses of property, but what we're really talking about here is a, a commercial use, a short-term rental and an event space within a residential neighborhood. And it feels as though the commission is being asked to justify an exception to something that wouldn't otherwise be allowed in a residential neighborhood to allow uh, a commercial event space, which will really affect the neighbors, noise, traffic, car alarms, people talking, 250 people uh, at a time talking on weekends and I'll, I'll end there. That's my three minutes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I do just want to apologize. Um, this the timer on screen was more correct about that time. I did not reset the the one I had going previously. So sorry you got beeped over. Um, next commenter we do have is um, the phone number with the last three digits one eight eight. I will give you permission to speak now. Please state your name if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, again, that's the, the phone number with the last digit, 188. Hello, this is Kevin Murphy here at 871 Mesa Road. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we, we can, can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm on the audio and uh, I, um, I, I'm i not going to add anything to the comments that others have made besides just saying that I'd like to add my name to the to the uh, to the register as a person who believes there is no value to the neighborhood by this commercial endeavor at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just to confirm, was this for uh, 100 Baranda or the previous? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you so much for confirming. Is would you like to add any more? No, I think it's all been said uh, previously by the other the other folks, but I just wanted to 
register my uh, my strong opposition to the uh, to this commercial endeavor. Okay, I've got it. Thank you so much for providing public comment. You have a good day. And let me mute. The next person on the list is David Ford. I will give you permission to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? On with the historic present. Preservation Commission. Thank you. First off, th thank you for allowing the outside comments. It, it was impossible for me to attend today in person. Otherwise, I would have. Um, I know we're all, all the callers are now becoming redundant on their items, but there's a couple of points I did want to bring up. Uh, we feel very strongly about our neighborhood because it's really, um, as, as a lot of the, the neighbors had, had mentioned, we have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, individuals, residents in our area that just love walking our road, our windy road that's very close to Monterey, but yet it sets itself so differently than any other any other road, I think, in Monterey. So it's just a really beautiful area. We feel very, very fortunate to be there. And um, a couple of things I did want to bring up is I know I do have such a hard time within a residential neighborhood to have any type of venue that would be as such, because we know that when a venue in a residential neighborhood occurs, it's just absolutely, absolutely dis disruption, which you really cannot avoid. I mean, it's unavoidable to tell you the truth. And, and we just cannot, at any price, we cannot sacrifice that. We, we really won't. So I wanted to, to um, mention that. I also wanted to mention just recently, as recently as uh, January of this year, the city of Monterey passed a measure which was to ban gasoline um, leaf blowers. And, and I want to thank Monterey for that because that was such a, an incredible decision and it has made a big difference in noise pollution. Now, with that said, to go backwards, and that's exactly what we would do, be doing in a case like this, is, is just absolutely just doesn't make no sense whatsoever. You just banned leaf blowers because of noise pollution. And now we're gonna have uh, venues that are gonna create exactly the same thing on top of traffic and a, a very narrow road that, I mean, honestly, we've had many close calls. I've, I've been on Mesa Road now for almost eight years and um, we've had many, many close calls. So uh, there's just so many impacts. I think from this point on, we'll probably a lot of people will be just redundant but I, I want to tell everybody we feel all very strongly about this. And, um, you know, thank you, the Shellings. They've been kind of the lead on this. And I want to thank both of you for, for, for doing that for us. Um, I, I just think that this is just a bad idea, uh, a real terrible idea. And I think the only thing that's really gaining from this is the owner's monetary benefit. Now, if they need money to maintain their own property, Talk to us. We'll see what we can do. But this is not the right way to do it. Okay? Uh, that's it for David Ford. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for providing public comment. You have a good day. Um, next on the list, we have M. Manson. Please state your name if you feel comfortable with it. Um, you should be able to speak now. Hi, my name is Marty Manson, and I am a retired museum professional. I'm also a neighbor of the Baranda property. And um, I'd like to state my opposition to it from the standpoint of my organizational brain looking at what's being provided or being proposed. I don't see anywhere in any of the documentation that we've received so far that it's actually being required of the owner to provide public access, um, free public access to this historic adobe. It clearly is historic. No one is saying anything other than it is a valuable resource for the city of Monterey. However, a monthly program with tours should be defined um, I understand from the documentation that the owner has spoken to the Monterey County Historical Commission and they're willing to work with the 
on this proposal. That's a good thing. They are not saying we will take over your docent program, um, recruit, train, schedule, and manage the program for you. They're saying we'll work with you on it. All of that takes time and money. And I'm wondering who is going to pay for that? Any nonprofit board is going to expect a quid pro quo for the service they offer. So I have real questions about just the monthly tours. How many will be offered every day? How many people can visit? Presumably some kind of exhibit needs to be constructed and put together. Who will pay for that? Whose collection will be tapped? Will it include original objects? These are all things that I would want to know if I were in the situation of having to do this, propose this. And none of these questions have been addressed in the documentation I've seen so far. I'm afraid you as a historic preservation commission are being asked to uh, support a commercial proposal in the guise of allowing public access to a historic resource. And I don't think that that's particularly fair. Um, in any case, thank you for allowing us to comment. I'm finished and you can uh, take the next person now. Thank you so much for providing public comment. You have a good evening. Thank you. And next on the list, we have Rita Painter Wo. You should have permission to speak now. Rita, are we? Oh. Mute. Can you hear me? We can. Thanks so much. Oh, okay. you provide your public comment. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, my husband and I are actually probably the closest neighbor to uh, the Adobe. We live at 30 Baranda Lane. And we share the driveway into the uh, Adobe complex. So obviously we feel that um, uh, we would be severely impacted uh, by any, any of the proposals that they've put forth so far. So I, I, you know, I've listened to the other comments and there's nothing that has been said that, that I don't agree with. So I don't need to really comment anymore. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing public comment. Mm -hmm. You have a good one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I do believe I do believe that we have heard from all of the joining attendees. I see no hands raised, um, but one more time, just a reminder, if you're in the meeting, press the raise your hand function in Zoom to raise your hand or dial star nine if you are joining by phone. And I do not see any hands raised and I will ask the live audience if anybody is remaining who would like to provide public comment. Sounds like we can move on. Okay, uh, I'm closing public comment now and I will ask again, do we need to vote on tabling this? Yes, and staff is recommending to table it to a date uncertain. Okay, can I have a um, motion and a second? I'll move to table this until Further notice, is that enough? Yep, okay, thank you. I'll second. Thank you, Kathy. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, I think we can vote. Definitely. First, we have Chair O'Neill. Aye. Vice Chair Smith Cravello. Aye. Commissioner Dawson. Oh, sorry. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Aye. And Commissioner Dawson. She's on. No, she's oh, off. She's, oh, she's yeah. actually she's out of the meeting. Yeah. I thought you were saying she's on view. She's Zoom. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and I will note that she's recused. And Commissioner Hambaro? Uh, yes. And Commissioner Rack? Aye. And Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Okay. This motion, this item is tabled to a date uncertain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Moving on to uh, commissioner comments. Do we have? Any, I do. Uh, Geraldine? I do. I, I have several comments. Um, one is relating to um, 980 Helen Street. Um, back in June of 2020, we had a meeting and I'm looking at the minutes for that meeting. And the action was to be continued in terms of removing a property from the historic context statement. So since then, um, we haven't gone back to continue that, um, that, that house. And, I, and because the house is a, um, about a thousand feet up the block from me up the street, I do see extensive uh, construction going on. I can and I'm wondering on that. Because it's still in the reconnaissance survey, I expect sure. it's being treated as a potentially historic residence. But we're. So I can provide an update on that. They withdrew their application to remove the house or the property from the reconnaissance survey. Uh, they applied for an architectural review permit um, and they had an architectural historian report with Secretary of Interior. Um, standard findings that what they were proposing meets the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, they have also they received approval of their architectural review permit. Then they um, subsequently applied for a building permit. And um, actually, they will now. Uh, my understanding is they want to make some changes to their plans, and they're they'll be submitting a building permit amendment. Well, they've already built. They built considerably. In fact, DMD Construction is the name of the truck I see in front all the time. Yeah, they have the building permit for that. However, they can make changes, but they would have to get a, a permit amendment through the planning division. Well, we just wondered the status because sure. we don't know exactly what they've proposed, but we do know that they haven't come back yet to, to complete taking the house off right it is um it's good to note that even with the house on the survey you can make needed improvements exactly. and if those improvements fit under the 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 legal um uh, mandate for for their status it's great because i know that house was an older house that needed improvements mm -hmm. so thank you for sure. clarifying that i appreciate it and so my second um my second comment is we have an Old Town Neighborhood Association and I belong to it. And um, they are have been working very hard to um, kind of have a, a walk that goes through the neighborhood. They've uh, talked to, um, most of these are homes in, in the neighborhood. We don't have any uh, significant buildings that aren't homes that I can think of, you know, commercial. And so um, they've looked at Mills Act homes and a few others that are, you know, perhaps on the reconnaissance survey, perhaps historic, but maybe aren't Mills. And they've talked to people would they mind having their house on this um, path of history, uh, kind of uh, through the neighborhood. So it's a neighborhood path of history. And they, they've they been working on this for, for quite a while. The, it would maybe start at Colton Hall, kind of go up the hill and come back down to the Perry House area and description, history and photos of the landmark homes that the owners have uh, agreed to have on the list um, would be available through an app through the Hometown Association. There isn't a lot of, uh, and we didn't want to make paper that could, could be a problem. So I really want to, um, say that I think it's a great thing. We have some beautiful homes, they're very different homes. And um, the fact that the, um, the, that this is the Old Town Neighborhood Association that wants to do it, and these are the people who own the houses, I think it may be a nice addition to the city of Monterey to highlight those houses and celebrate them. So I wanted to congratulate them for doing that. Gerald, can I ask, when we have, um... I know when we'll get back to having like the city history fest, mm -hmm. will this be um, something that can be highlighted? I think it would be great. Mm -hmm. And and I think 
Uh, perhaps Nancy Soleil, uh, who's the secretary, is on. Perhaps her husband, who's the president, they're probably listening, and um, I'm sure they would they would uh, look for opportunities to share it with others. Great. Mm -hmm. Are there? Is that is that it? Okay. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Have I have a question. Um, are we going to be getting hard copies of the agendas, or is it going to stay online? Okay. Can oh. in writing be email? Yes. That okay. Is actually ideal. Okay. Okay. Very Perfect. Good We're old school, so in writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before, and if you want Sorry, my microphone was off. <laughs> I, just, I thought I was you, done but... speaking for the meeting. Um, we don't encourage use of printing packets just because it does use a lot of paper. Um, so if, if you do have another method of viewing it, that is of course accepted and welcome. If you would like me to print out your packet um, consistently, uh, just please email, send me an email, just stating, stating uh, you know, if you would like to have a printed packet every time or just on occasion, you know, sometimes there are specific plans that are easier to look at on the paper rather than in, on the computer. So I did find that out um, recently this week, since we were going back to hybrid, it has been brought up. <laughs> so that is the new answer for you. And that includes everybody uh, viewing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other? Um comments or questions? I have a comment yes who I can't see they just sorry Lori okay <laughs> Lori has a comment uh I just um <clears throat> want some clarification about the Mills Act I was under the impression that when a person agrees to the benefits of the Mills Act that they are required to have some sort of once a year open house or something. And I was just wondering if that is done or if it isn't done, is it still within the Mills Act that that is a requirement? We have done them in the past um, due to staffing constraints. We have not done those lately, um, but we're hoping to pick that up um, as soon as we're staffed up. Uh, Lori, I think that the Mills Act um, states that the house would be available mm -hmm. for uh, a public tour or open house, not that it's uh, required every year. And I know some of them have been on the history history walks or Christmas in the Adobe. Right. I guess I was referring like to the inspections. Oh, Mills Act okay. Inspections. I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, the um, the requirement to be open to the public yeah. um, is no longer. So in my world, uh, when they have History Fest and the library used to have their um, um, 10 open houses that they would pick from the list of, of Mills Act, um, sometimes they would get off into famous artists. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's just my, my feeling. The, for clarification, then it's not a requirement for a Mills Act property to have a once a year something. No, oh, they just have to be available for, um, and I, I think if you were asked several years in a row and didn't uh, agree to let people come in and look, um, that you, um, the city might take another look at, at your contract. Correct. Right. Like, it is written into the contract. Yeah. So who does the asking? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, Geraldine? It, it really hasn't happened since I've been on this commission. But I think um, those people that have agreed to have their Mills Act home on this walking tour in a way, 
is is saying they appreciate that they are Mills Act and it is a, a public uh, informed status. So it's not a, a secret status because it's a, you know, we, we have a, if you want to pull them up by the computer, you would know there, we have a list of the homes that have Mills Act. And so this way the public can actually see on the outside those homes. And that's um, the primary um, um, look, you know, that we have when we look at Mills Act. We don't look at a, a kitchen or a bathroom or we don't, we, we have never uh, looked at the interior of a house and made that part of the Mills Act. It's been an outside, yeah, you're right. outside view. Okay. So I think in a way, I think that that is a, a, a way they can share their status and say that they are homeowners that have historic homes and they participated in maintaining them through the support of the city of Monterey through Mills Act. And I think that's yeah. a nice thing. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so it is. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm still curious, like, how is it, I mean, how does the general public know about these homes that have received the benefits of the Mills Act? Is there not a requirement for a once a year, whatever? Uh, you know, a walk by or there is a list on the on the city's website. Uh, I believe that lists all the historic properties in Monterey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one way we know what is historic. But again, <laughs> there they have to make it um, available. But I don't think it's like they have to open their house up to the neighbors once a year that's not really how it's been working um, so how does it work the city or the library or whoever is doing or i i'm guessing like the uh, old town association would ask them um i i don't know that we've had any we haven't had a lot of people ask a lot of organizations asking and um i don't think it's been an issue with people saying no um, but um, whoever mentioned that it's mostly the outsides right. um, is is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's the library who used to have the historic homes every October. Right. Um, I went on one of those. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a lot of those had had Mills Act contracts. Mm -hmm. yes. Is that that's the answer? I, it may not say okay this so part. there's no there's no mechanism of enforcing that this happens through the city through the mills act is that uh, a correct assumption i i think I, that is correct um if if uh i'll say the library asked uh, uh, a mills act uh, uh, contract um, property if we can come in Christmas in the Adobes or um, for their history um, walk. And they said no um, every year, I think it would be looked at, but that hasn't happened. So, um, you know, Mills Act, I think is maybe 10, 15 years old. I, this isn't, isn't a process that has been, um, you know, forever and ever in the city of Monterey. So. Um, yeah, we're more concerned if your gutters are falling off. Um, right, or you yeah. haven't painted because you were supposed to, or your roof's leaking. Right, right. So who, so who enforces that? Because I remember uh, at some point. Zoning, I guess. Um, I, so at I, some point, I, know. I noticed a house that was under the Mills Act that hadn't been painted. And so I contacted code enforcement. Good. And yeah. they they were in charge of it and it got painted. So okay. you know, it was all good. That's but if how you don't know what <laughs> is a Mills Act property, uh, you know, it's just it seems to me it's just like kind of it's left up to who knows who to have these properties like listed in 
you know, observe from the outside. I mean, if you don't know, there's no plaque. Oh, what about the plaques? That's there right. is a plaque. That, supposed is part, plaque. that is part of the um, Mills Act. And Christy, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that is part of it. They are have to have a plaque. We bless the plaque. Um, so I that is part of it. And they have to, the contract renews every 10 years. So uh, at some point, I guess, <laughs> Out, but like so many things uh, in Monterey, um, it depends on citizens being the eyes and ears of the city. I know uh, when um, people have come here, commercial properties for signs, which we hate, um, we hate doing dealing with signs, that when they don't fulfill the um, uh, what what we required then we have uh i've called the city and said hey do you realize that they've added more text to their sign and uh, the city takes care of it so that's how that's pretty much how it works on the ground I'll, so I'll when's it has uh chris chris has something to add hi larry this is chris schmidt I, i'll add that um I, you know we we do have a, a, a goal to have staff go and audit all of those Mills Act property maintenance schedules. You know, it's it's just been a, a difficult uh, effort to do with our staffing levels and e even even fully staffed. Um, it, you know, we have uh, I think close to 60 Mills Act properties now, and to go and look at the intervals of of all of their main maintenance, it takes it takes coordination with the homeowner as well as you know time away from staff from working on what what we're already tasked with by the city council. So, you know, ultimately we do want to be able to do that. Thank you, Chris. Um, any, any so, so when a Mills Act house is restored and got its plaque, does the Historic Preservation Commission go and look at the plaque and the restoration? I mean, even from the outside, not the inside. Um, but Geraldine can answer that. Yeah, I'll just take this one. We had we had a great invitation several years to go to go see a plaque, um, but we're not always invited to see every plaque. And I think you're you're bringing up a point. I don't know that every Mills Act house does have a visible plaque. I don't know, and I think that's part of a kind of a checklist of is are the owners of these houses doing what they said they would do. And uh, Chris addressed that short staff and it's something we want to do. And uh, I think we're going to try to do a little better now that um, maybe we're going to have another staff member soon and we're moving out of COVID um, situation. I, I also think um, every time you go into the planning office, you do see Mills Act information posted. Um, if you're interested in any kind of um, historic house information and you look it up, um, you will find Mills Act and Monterey's been very um, proactive about it. And you can find lots of lots of information uh, about cities that just a few that have Mills Act. Um, you know, we're one of the only cities in our area, but there are a few other cities that have it in California. And um, this, and also, uh, we appreciate the training we had today, Jennifer, that you helped us uh, get the, they talked about some of the other cities that have Mills Act, San Diego mm -hmm. and Sacramento were, were you, right you Utah. Yeah. It, well, it, but I was thinking oh, in our area, right. And, and it's interesting to see uh, other cities have other ways of, of um, highlighting historic buildings. Um, we're, you know, I think it's, been a big help to Monterey to have Mills Act. And I think it's, um, we've had property owners that come in and they want to be removed from the reconnaissance survey. They don't want to be historic. And then after they find out about Mills Act, they've changed their mind and they're willing to take the money they might save in property tax and put it toward fixing up their house and maintaining it. And, and we want it to be an attractive option for people. But we do want to kind of maintain a, an accurate list so that everybody's on the same page. And we're, we're, we're working on it. I, I also believe, Carol, yeah. uh, 
see you. Um, I, I just want to inject here. I believe the uh, plaques were um, a fairly new within the last few years. So the early Mills Act uh, did not require um, plaques. That was something I think the commission did. Um, I'm going to ask Carol Dawson to, to speak so we can move along here. Yeah, hi. Um, along that same uh, subject, um, I'm sorry, my, my camera isn't working for some reason. But um, anyway, um, uh, 603 605 Hoffman, I brought that up last, last month, and I don't know whether the staff has had a chance to take a look at that, but it looks to me like um, they haven't done anything at all that they said they would do when they were approved uh, a year ago for a Mills Act contract. Hi, Carol. Uh, staff is going to look into that. Uh, we've just been short staff right now, um, but by the next meeting, I will have an update for you. Oh, that's fine. I understand that you're short staffed right now, but um, be good if you could look at it at some time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Did you? I can't hear you. Well, your I guess I'll say it out out loud. I was, um, Carol. I see you. You're still with us. Mm -hmm. All mills yeah. at houses have plaques. Right. Well, after a certain date, because our, our house has a plaque, but I don't know whether the some of the very early ones maybe did not. Okay. I, I'll just add, I, I'm actually not sure if the early days were were required, but I ever since I've been here and there, there have been a number, I, I'm fairly certain that m most, if not all, Mills Acts in the last four and a half years mm -hmm. have gotten their plaque. Yeah. It, uh, it, and, uh, and the way that it works for just for Glory's and everyone's information is, um, the applicant works with staff. Staff has basically a template. They propose um, the language that, that they want on that plaque, which is typically the, the reason for significance that's listed in their DPR, their intensive survey. And, and that's what they, the information they use on their plaque. And so they show it to staff and staff approves it and then they go and have it made and installed. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's a really good thing for the mm -hmm. it, it helps those those of us who walk around town. I love reading them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other comments? I was just going to make an announcement. It does. It's regarding a historic building. In case you all didn't know, um, there is no visitor center in Monterey anymore. I was working at the French consulate, the building to which I just referred. Uh, for six and a half years, uh, which I was working for the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the city does own the building, but the Convention and Visitors Bureau has decided to get out of Visitor Center for whatever reason, and uh, they have kept me to do some information tables at Fisherman's Wharf, so you may see me there occasionally, and their big thing is marketing for conferences. So you may see me at the at the uh, conference center with an information table if different uh, groups that come to the area for their meetings want a local with local information. So I will be doing that for them still. But um, I am saddened about the visitor center closing. Um, the CVB did a national survey in the spring to bring, to bring people here. And you know, the name of the company is Convention and Visitors Bureau. So to close the visitor center after doing this big campaign doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, mm -hmm. uh, and you. as you probably know, Pacific Grove and Carmel have visitor centers. We did represent the whole county. And that's something that, you know, is in discussion is why can't we just represent Monterey? So, um, We'll see what happens, but uh, for now, the city, I guess, is getting another tenant for the uh, French consulate, um, from what I understand. So I just wanted to bring that. Yeah, no, thank you. I was just going to add. I believe last I checked, it was the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce that's that's occupying the building now. That that what, Chris? It was the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, I believe, is in that building now. I'm I'm not a hundred. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I understand they're not interested in uh, dealing with visitors or tourists. That's what I and I just heard that last week with someone who would know. So I don't know. We'll Any, see. Anything else? 
everyone happy? Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are adjourned. Thank yes, you. As happy as can be. All right. Oh, I can't.